Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for the Small Business Bootcamp and Resource Collective on this Thursday, October 5th. I'm Robert Theobald, Small Business Ombudsman and Vice President of Small Business Services at the Arizona Commerce Authority. Uh, we'd like to start these uh, by thanking all of our community partners. We couldn't do the boot camp sessions without our community partners. Uh, we have over 120 in total that have helped support and do these boot camps. For those not familiar, the Small Business Boot Camp is designed to help small businesses return stronger from the COVID crisis. It is a statewide initiative supported by all those community partners. And it is also a resource collective and content library. So let's get into the, the resource collective and the content library a little bit. So the resource collective are tools and resources brought to us by our community partners to help support small businesses. We have a separate web page for them and you can find access to this from our bootcamp homepage. Um, about the middle of the page, you'll find the link to the resource collective. Um, there's a lot of great information that you can find on that page. Additionally, as I mentioned, we have a content library. As we do all of our boot camps every Tuesday and Thursday morning, we like to record them. As you saw, this session is being recorded. And by recording all of our webinars, we've created a content library of over 140 plus sessions uh, that you can go back and review anytime. There's no cost. And we include the slide decks and any other materials from our presenters um, that they talked about in that information. And so it creates a great opportunity to go back and rewatch sessions or watch sessions that you may have missed um, or share with others that uh, maybe will benefit from those webinars. And we cover about every different topic that a small business could face um, in their day-to-day -day activities. Another couple of pages that are very important are the state's COVID information and resource page, arizonatogether.org, that has everything related to COVID-19. And then for COVID-19 business resources, we have our azcommerce.com forward slash COVID-19. Now that's easy to find. You can just go to azcommerce.com and you'll see a big blue ribbon across the top of the website with a link to that page. But that page includes business guidance, and, and also a great uh, link to the page, which is financial resources, where we update all the different uh, programs that may be going on at the city, county, state, federal levels. The ACA also has a number of programs that can help support you and your small business. First, we have our small business services. We also have our workforce division, and then our Arizona MEP, our Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Uh, for small to medium-sized manufacturers throughout the state. Another program that's awesome is our small business checklist. And this is a great tool for those looking to start a business or expand your business into new product lines or new categories. And it can help you identify the commonly requested licensing, registration, and compliance needs at the local, state, and federal levels. Now with that, we'd like to transition to our small business updates. Um, if you've been with us before, you will have heard me talk about these, these topics right now. Um, there are, there's a lot of great information and a lot of important things with these same topics. PPP loan forgiveness, can't stress it enough. If you got a loan and you haven't, especially the first go around, um, and you haven't applied for forgiveness, that window for application has already started. Um, and is maybe up um, depending on when you got that loan. So to, in order to get forgiveness, you have to apply for it. It's not automatic. Um, the SBA has set up a portal for small businesses under with loans under $150,000. They can go onto there and apply directly through the SBA um, as long as their lender's on there. But the PPP loan uh, forgiveness is between you and your lender, but you do have to apply and can't stress that enough. Um, also, the EIDL, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, has been expanded. The SBA expanded the limits from 500000 to $2 million, um, depending on your business needs. Again, that is strictly a loan program, but it has a, a favorable interest rate of 3.75 uh, with a term of up to 30 years. Uh, and it is still available. If you haven't applied, you can still apply for that program. And if you're in one of the flood uh, impacted areas of Arizona, um, there's a separate EIDL program for that. 
um, if you need to apply because of the flood impact. Also the employee retention credit, uh, can't stress this enough as you're working through your, your business, uh, your accounting and your taxes. The employee retention credit is a great opportunity to access some additional funds that are available through the CARES Act. Um, this is, there's a, a pretty significant amount of funding available in this program. It is complicated and it will take some work, but uh, the funding is, again, is very significant. It'd be well worth the time and effort to, to see if you qualify and, and get that funding. And then to help with that, our small business development centers can help with any of these programs. They are a no cost business counseling program that the state has uh, through the community colleges and through funding from the SBA. The ACL also provides a little bit of funding for them to help support their efforts in bringing that no cost counseling to small businesses in all 15 counties. So with that, we wanna jump in and look at some of the upcoming sessions. You can see today is session 191, um, uh, cybersecurity. We're gonna have another good cybersecurity session today. And then next um, Thursday on the 7th, I think earlier I said Thursday, I wish it was Thursday already. Today is Tuesday. Um, on this Thursday, we're gonna have workforce employers want. Um, this is gonna be brought to us by our workforce experts at the uh, Arizona Office of Economic Opportunity. Um, and then on Tuesday of next week on the 12th, we've got techniques to reduce stress and burnout. Um, I'm really looking forward to this session. We've got a new presenter for it and the information she shared on this presentation looked pretty awesome. Uh, so it should be a really good session. And then on Thursday, October 14th, we've got another new presenter with uh, five tactics to end the year in high gear. So we're looking for that as well. Um, and we have another, you know, we don't have them listed here, but we have a great lineup through the end of the year. We're excited about the presenters we brought on to finish the year strong. So with that, we're gonna jump into today's session. We've got Jeffrey Crump and his team at Cybersecurity Training and Consulting. And uh, so Jeffrey, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the time over to you. Great, thank you, Robert. Uh... Let me get you off that other screen. Okay. All right. Very looks good. good. Um, yeah, it looks good. Okay, great. Th fantastic. Uh, yeah, as Robert uh, mentioned, um, there's a library of uh, uh, courses out there. We recently uh, delivered another one called um, Holiday Hacking. And in that session, I encourage you to certainly go take a look at that. Uh, we talked about some of the most common kinds of things that um, the things that you can do as a small business owner to kind of, kind of help protect yourself. And in that session, oddly enough, we, we talked about something called DNS, a d domain name server, and, and the function of that kind of acting as a, uh, uh, a middleman. It takes an, an IP and a, a, a URL that you type in, a common name, www.something or another, and it translated into a numerical thing, and it then it routes you off to the correct website. So oddly enough, the the issue that uh, we saw pervasive yesterday with Facebook and Instagram and uh, that uh, now I don't uh, I haven't seen anything this morning to denote whether that was a malicious type of thing, but. Um, we have these these types of servers that do that out on the internet and route your traffic from one part of the world to the next, but also inside of corporate networks. And effectively, that is what has uh, happened to those guys is somebody got a hold of or whether it was, you know, again, intentional or accidental, you know, sometimes people update systems and put a slash or a dot where it's not supposed to be and then, you know, everything kind of falls apart. But one of these types of servers you know, got updated and the information wasn't correct. And so uh, all of the, you know, mappings to the different websites and servers and all that type of thing, it all just kind of fell down to its knees. And, and that's kind of what's happened there. Now, um, in this session, we're going to continue that conversation. And in there, we did, we did talk a bit about um, things that you can do for your email system, not just, you know, we talk about antivirus and those things that you can kind of protect yourself. Um, but there are things that you can kind of do to protect your brand and there are configurations in your email uh, that you can do. You can set up that provides legitimacy 
for your organization. So when you're sending email uh, emails out to people, they can trust that it's actually coming from your company. And the reason we talk about this, and a lot of this stuff uh, really kind of overlaps, um, is because in that session, we talked a bit about social engineering and phishing attacks. And we're going to hit that again here um, because we, you know, we've seen in recent uh, uh, months and years the, the success of the attackers, even on small businesses. We, uh, if you may recall, uh, Barbara Corcoran does an attack by, or uh, almost a victim of a phishing attack where uh, a, a malicious actor pr- uh, created a fake email address that was just one character off from theirs and sent a request for an invoice payment. Uh, <clears throat> luckily, they caught that wire transfer of $380,000 just before it happened. So, but if you if they had implemented some of those email techniques that we talk about in the last session, it would have very quickly identified to her staff that, oh, <laughs> that email address looks right, but it's not from our legitimate email address. And we can do that certainly for ourselves and our own small businesses but we, 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 even as a small business, we have our own supply chain. We, we work with other vendors and we do pay invoices. So um, one method for kind of protecting your own small business is to ensure that those that you do business with also are doing some minimal types of things to protect themselves and their brand. So when you're getting those email addresses from them, you have a high degree of confidence that it's actually that vendor that you've worked with, you know, time and time again. So just kind of keep that in mind that, you know, you, you, you do have some uh, capability to kind of dictate or, or help uh, mandate to your suppliers in your supply chain that they can implement some of these security controls. And it helps protect yourself and, and them from uh, attack. In this uh, session, we're going to, we're going to, dig a, de- a bit deeper in to help you kind of understand what's kind of going on in the minds of the attackers and different types of attackers and these things that we call tactics, techniques, and procedures. Uh, now, we're just going to, you know, brush the surface. As you'll see, it can be very complex and very deep, but, you know, it's our firm belief that, uh, you know, back in the day, you know, when John, you know, McAfee was around, you know, uh, he's, he recently passed away, uh, but, you um, he said at one point that uh, humans are the weakest link in the cybersecurity chain. And, you know, considering the fact that the majority of cyber attacks do originate or target at us as individuals, and, you know, we're the ones clicking on the link, so we shouldn't be, uh, you know, type, type of thing. You know, there is some reality based in that. But we're firm believers that we can kind of transition us uh, humans into the strongest link. But it's more than just... Um, you know, knowing what link to not click or when not to open a file type of thing. We want to kind of give employees, employers a bit more context, kind of understand what the motivations and the, and the threat actors and what they're doing uh, to kind of put those things in, in, a, in a better kind of a set of context. So you help you kind of, you know, tie one and one to kind of get or understand what's going on from a broader perspective. Overall, we want to protect your brand, your reputation. Um, you know, last thing you want to do is, you know, have your site down or your business down, you know, some big evil logo up there, or you just can't access it because, uh, you know, some bad guys are doing some bad stuff to your business. So let's, uh, let's continue that conversation. Um, we're going to dig into, well, like I said, so, so who are some of these threat actors with different types of uh, considerations that they might, uh, they might have. Uh, we'll talk about those TTPs, um, again, just kind of on the surface, but help you kind of get some visibility into that, that world of the attacker. Um, um, and then we're going to talk about some three different types of controls that you, uh, as a business owner, can implement. And, um, you know, they're not all, you know, technical. They're not going to require any technical skill or expertise to be able to do these things. Uh, and then finally, we're going to wrap up again, kind of act as a, you know, a, 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 a just kind of a closing session on security awareness again and uh, uh, humans as the um, weakest link to strongest link. All right. So who are the adversaries out there? Well, there's, we can put them into different kinds of categories and, 
Uh, one of those is uh, skill based. Um, so, you know, how sophisticated is the attacker themselves? Uh, what kind of skill, uh, tools that they have at their, uh, you know, beck and call to kind of use? Um, it doesn't really take much uh, these days with the, you know, use of uh, YouTube and the availability of open source tools. It doesn't really take much for somebody to become a novice type of a hacker and to very quickly kind of craft a, a phishing email. It really doesn't take much effort to, to do that, but we'll see, you know, uh, as we, as we progress and, and organizations, you know, put in these controls, then it takes a more sophisticated, uh, more skilled adversary to be able to get past those controls to get over those different layers or walls uh, of defense that we put up in our organization. Um, then there's the motivations. And of course, some of the three main buckets we've got are those that are financially motivated. So they're, you know, they're trying to get into your systems, maybe get copies of your credit, you know, your customer records or credit card information or, you know, whatever it is kind of a thing, but something that they can, you know, take out on to, uh, you know, one of the, the, the deep dark web or, or uh, some of the other, you know, readily available types of websites and sell that stuff. Or, and then, you know, some actor, a, additional threat actor in the chain is then going to try and leverage that, maybe trying to log into an account and transfer money, but it's all fine, you know, financially motivated types of things. And then we have the social cause. So you may, you know, have heard about anonymous, right? And, you know, the, 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 the uh, guy Fox mask and, you know, these guys are doing different things. Well, they tend to be socially, you know, social cause motivated. So, um, you know, if they don't like what the Democrats are doing, don't like what the Republicans are doing, don't like what's going on in one part of the world, or, uh, you know, they can kind of come into action and depend upon your organization, depend what your organization is doing and sponsoring, um, these folks may or may not be on your radar at any given point in time. So imagine, um, you know, you, your company decides to, to sponsor some type of event uh, or some other company or partner in some faraway land. Well, uh, what you didn't know is that there's a, you know, a group of hackers that, you know, absolutely despise that country and where, you know, that activity is going to go on. Now, normally they might not have any interest in your business and hacking it and trying to fish it or, you know, do something malicious to it. But <clears throat> because now you're involved in this other part of the world where they, <clears throat> you know, are, you know, emotionally invested in what's going on over there. <clears throat> now you've popped up on their radar uh, and they might, you might just see uh, different types of uh, attacks or an increase in the, uh, the types of uh, phishing emails or, um, you know, other types of reconnaissance that might be going on in your account. And then there's nationalism. And, you know, typically we call these nation state uh, types of things. So uh, all the big nations, you know, the United States, uh, including Russia, China, Korea, you know, all the big countries have, uh, have these teams of cyber warriors that are kind of out there, you know, defending and attacking uh, different parts of the world and, and doing all kinds of different uh, things. Um, if you guys remember, um, uh, you know, well, there some major attacks uh, that uh, we'll talk about, but Stuxnet is one of those big ones from a, a, a few years ago where um, the uh, cent Iranian centrifuge uh, basically, you know, got destroyed. So the Iranians, you know, had built this uh, centrifuge environment. They, you know, isolated it. Uh, it's what was called on a sneaker net, which basically means there's no external network connection to that environment. And the only way you can really can kind of bring data into that environment would be over a sneaker net. And that's just like your tennis shoes. You have to literally walk it in there. So, um, so the United States working hand in hand with Israel, we, we crafted up some, uh, some malware. We convinced somebody to walk it into the environment. Uh, and then um, we monitored what was going on in that environment and so watched what all the all the control panels were doing and and <clears throat> and we recorded all that information and watched what was going on. And then when it came time to actually uh, perpetrate the attack, we replayed 
all of that normal kind of behavior of the centrifuges. So all the guys that were working in the control console in the console, you know, they're seeing normal stuff. Now, what they don't know is they're seeing recorded information all the while in the back room where you can literally go in and you can look inside and you can see that this, the, these subterfuges were going completely wacky, you know, overspinning and being destroyed. Now, you know, people died as a result of that, but, you know, the nation state guys are out there and, uh, you know, it's real. <laughs> but, you know, fortunately, I think for most small businesses, uh, the nation states are probably not a, a, a major concern for us, but know that they are out there. Um, and then, you know, hey, not all attacks are by these bad guys that are, you know, 5,000 miles away. We can have uh, malicious insiders or, uh, and, and these malicious insiders can either be intentional or unintentional. So, uh, you know, you might have a rogue employee who's upset because they didn't get promoted and now they're going to, you know, maybe try to extract some data or email out some important files or print them and take them home or, you know, whatever. So, you know, we do have these uh, employees that, that can be that. Um, those are our intentional ones. Then we have the unintentional. So, you know, everybody's kind of going about their day and, you know, some, you know, somebody, you know, clicks on a link that they shouldn't have, um, you know, and it doesn't trigger this massive ransomware attack. And so all the computers don't shut down immediately. But maybe the bad guys have set up a command and control access into your environment, right? So you don't really know the user or the employee doesn't really know that they've been compromised, but their account might begin to be used by the bad guys to do bad stuff. So we can have these, uh, uh, you know, trusted internal people that can kind of be victimized. And as I mentioned before, don't forget about those third parties, those suppliers. We, you know, even as a small business, we do have a supply chain. And what the bad guys will do inherently is, uh, you know, when we have this relationship, we create trust between ourselves and our suppliers and, and those that we, you know, contract to. And the bad guys will target the weakest link in that particular chain. So you imagine a, you know, a large, uh, defense supplier and they've got you know thousands of smaller businesses and that they do business with and then those smaller business have you do business with even smaller businesses and smaller and smaller and smaller and you know, as you would expect the smaller 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 you get the less sophisticated the less you know the size of the cybersecurity you know team that's in there protecting those assets the sophistication of you know defense in those organizations gets kind of less and less and less and less so if we can, if the bad guys can compromise, you know, one of the, the, the smaller, smaller businesses in that chain, but then leverage that trust relationship to the next one, set up a foothold in there, and then just kind of continue to kind of jump across the lily pads because eventually they want to attack the big guy. And so they leverage that trust relationship. You're in, you're, you know, you're very well in a chain like that. So you need to protect yourself so you don't pass on that threat but then you need to push down those security controls to even your other small, you know, smaller partners and say, hey, you know, at a minimum, let's set up, you know, these email records so I, so, uh, you know, so I can trust the emails that are coming from you. I know they're from a known entity, right? Uh, so there are some real minimal types of things that we can do as a small business to protect ourselves uh, from becoming victimized. All right, so let's look at. Uh, you know, a bit more into those, you know, skill-based types of attackers. So uh, on the low end of the range, we have what are called the script kitties. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, you too could be a script kitty if you had an hour to invest in watching a YouTube video and going out and downloading some free open source tools and the wherewithal to kind of craft one of those. You could do that. Right. Um, a lot of these tools that are out there that are open source are created, as you know, we see a lot of times created with good in mind. Right. They, they're created under under the, you know, the guise of being, you know, open source penetration testing tools. Well, <clears throat> you know, the thing about penetration testing um, is, uh, you know, these tools and they go out and uh, not only can they identify weaknesses, within your infrastructure and things like that, but there are tools that actually then exploit those weaknesses, right? So yeah, that's great if you wanna you know, 
hey, how, how good are my defenses? I can go try these tools. But then obviously the bad guys can go, well, how good are their defenses? And let me craft something that's uh, actually malicious and try to you know, penetrate into their environment. So, uh, so on the low end, we have, you know, these, uh, these script kitties and Kali Linux is, is one of those uh, types of tools and, and, uh, you know, hey, the, the motivations, yeah, maybe they're, you know, they're, maybe there is, you know, financial motivation there. Uh, but, you know, maybe sometimes it's just, you know, a pissed off customer, right? Uh, uh, you, and, you know, they you just get really upset and they're like, oh, I'm going to go after these guys. And like I said, they go invest a, uh, an hour or two in YouTube videos and downloading Kali Linux where there's, you know, more than 300 different types of tools, you know, right there. I mean, uh, some of them are literally, you know, click one, then click A, then click B, you know, click D and hit submit and boom, things are happening. Um, and yes, yeah, like, oh, why are those tools available? And, but like I said, I mean, it, you know, if get used for good, <laughs> they're very valuable. Used for bad, they can, they can be bad. Um, but the, you know, it does take some degree of sophistication to move beyond that. And um, you know, now we're getting into you know, those that are you know, pulling off larger types of an attacks all the way up into our APTs, our advanced persistent threats. You know, these are the organizations, again, many times, uh, are sponsored by nation states, but they're, you know, trying to get into an organization and establish a foothold. And we don't really know, you know, what their objectives are until they pull them off, you know. So, you know, for example, the, you know, we, we sat in this in the uh, Iranian subterfuge uh, for an extended period of time, capturing information. So recording it and that type of thing. Um, organizations, uh, you know, we see, uh, we do some work on the federal side of the house. So, you know, the United States has uh, the F-35 um, fighter. Well, now China has a J-31 that looks remarkably similar, right? Uh, how many organizations, could you imagine how complex that fighter jet is, how many organizations need to be compromised in order for the Chinese to be able to be able to reproduce something as complex as a jet? A lot, right? So it's not just, you know, one big uh, organization that has to be compromised. It's a whole chain across there. Um, um, yeah, so we don't know really what their motivations are, but, um, you know, in the end, uh, you know, could even be from, you know, data destruction, uh, data exfiltration, those types of things. Uh, a lot of days now we're seeing, you know, the ransomware attacks. And if you're concerned about those, I encourage you to kind of go back and watch the, the, uh, the other video that we did, uh, because we do talk about some uh, things that you can do as a small business to protect yourself from, from ransomware. All right, so those financially motivated ones, we've seen, um, you know, or, organizations like Carbon Act who pulled off a one $1 billion kind of a of a of a, of a heist. Uh, they uh, compromised bank uh, uh, banking systems around the world, and um, you know, <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty sophisticated type of an attack, but uh, collectively uh, around a, a one billion dollar draw against uh, multiple banks around the world. Um, then we have, uh, you know, organizations like Lizard Squad, you know, uh, that are going out there and they're doing distributed denial of system attacks against, you know, gaming systems. And again, you know, a, you know, a distributed denial of, of system attack is where they go out and they compromise uh, many times um, the, the all the Internet of Thing devices. So the, you know, webcam that's monitoring your front yard or you know, your, your smart TV or your smart refrigerator, you know, whatever it is, oftentimes it's the webcams because they, they, they tend to be um, internet accessible because we're all kind of monitoring those from work and that kind of a thing. But they will compromise, install some malware, and at any given point in time, they'll say, uh, they'll, they'll point to a website or, you know, some service and they'll say, attack! And basically, because there are you know hundreds of thousands of these devices out there, 
uh, it basically overwhelms that website or that service. And, and so that's what a distributed denial of service attacks will do it. And so they'll do it against gaming sites and things like that. Um, and uh, we've seen, you know, other uh, organizations, I don't know if you remember the, the movie Interview, so this is the Lazarus group, um, you know, they attacked Sony and, you know, you know effectively stopped the, the release of that movie from coming out. Um, and we have shadow brokers, which were involved with some uh, major, um, major attacks and release of, uh, of very sophisticated attack tools, uh, what do we call zero day exploits. Um, and you may have heard this term, before, but basically what a zero day is, is um, so somebody, <clears throat> excuse me, a hacker, and he goes out and he's looking for weaknesses uh, in software, maybe that's Microsoft Office products, or maybe it's a platform or an operating system or, or something like that. <clears throat> and he's going out there and he's looking for a, a weakness in there, and then they identify it, okay? Um, now, this you know, if, if nobody knows about this weakness, this vulnerability, um, that's a zero day. Now, how does it move beyond a zero day? So uh, it is a zero day until a patch is made available. Now, so you could, you know, there could be an, a weakness in, you know, a system that you run in your environment, um, uh, that hasn't been patched. Well, it's kind of a zero, it's a zero day on your system. You haven't patched it, but if there's a patch available, it's not formally called a, uh, a zero day because you just need to apply that patch. But a zero day is one of those uh, weaknesses that uh, exist until a patch is made available. That's, uh, that's all that really kind of means. So, but um, very, very valuable um, um, depending upon how damaging it can be uh, some of those zero day, you know, the large organizations, advanced persistent threats, when they find these, uh, they tend to kind of tend to kind of hold on to them, um, you know, and use them for, you know, whatever purposes they want. Um, there are other different types of hackers out there. And, you know, we talk about white hat, black hat and gray hat types of uh, attackers in our previous session. But the motivation is different, and uh, you know, here are some uh, social cause motivated ones. We we talked about uh, anonymous, and you know, we've got you know folks that are you know going in and capturing information and, and making it you know public release. So WikiLeaks is a, a source for a lot of hacktivism, where the attackers are going in and finding this stuff uh, and then releasing it. Um, but um, you know, it, it can be geographical as well. So you've got a group like Cyber Berkut who um, is you know a group of pro-Russian hacktivists that you know tend to target you know the Ukraine against those. But we'll see those kinds of things across different types of um, uh, philosophies uh, that are out there. So just kind of keep that in mind that hey, as I'm going out and I'm doing things around the world, uh, you know my threat profile can change based upon where I'm beginning to kind of do some business, okay? And understanding your threat profile as a business, whether you're small, medium, or large, is important because everything that we, we want to do with regard to securing our, our businesses should be risk-driven. So we have to understand what are the risks and as we'll see here shortly, what are, what are the tactics, techniques, and procedures that are used by some of those threat actors that are out there? So all in all, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, around the world, and this is just a you know, small flavor of, of what the, you know, what those are, you know, at, uh, at, the, at the NSA, um, you know, they have a whole team that you know they they literally have a catalog of of tools that they can kind of flip through you know <laughs> literally kind of and, and pick and choose depending upon you know what the mission is at any given point in time um you can see up in russia we've got some and and they're tied to um some of the military uh or security entities up there uh we also have energetic bear so this one's a um 
has, has been around for a bit, but certainly one that is uh, quite concerning. Um, so this, as you can kind of denote from the name energetic bear, uh, they're focused on the, the um, uh, what we call our, our industrial control systems, our critical infrastructure related to energy. So they have been really kind of honing their skills on power systems, for example, in the Ukraine. So there are some examples where the Ukrainian power systems have been taken down by these threat actors. Now, we, you know, we, we, we've been going through this pandemic and we know how awful that has been. Uh, you know, imagine what that would be like uh, if we didn't have you know, electricity or water and these types of things. So these bad guys that are out there, uh, when we see them, you know, these one-off attacks in these smaller countries and, and things like that, we go, oh, well, that, that's, you know, that's so far away. That's, that's not, you know, nothing we need to be worried about. It, it, actually, that is a concern because, uh, you know, in technology, um, you know, and, and anything else really kind of you're developing a product or a service, you, you, you typically test that, right? So you, you build a small version of it and you test it. You, you make it a little more sophisticated and you test it. And this process goes on and on until you kind of get to something that's like, aha, all right, this is what we really need, right? Well, this is what, you know, this how those types of things should be viewed, that these bad guys are going out there and they're honing their skills, they're testing the, the, the tools of their trade, and they're getting them ready, right? So, uh, you know, not all doom and gloom, but just understand that, you know, there are absolutely hacker groups out there that are focused on, at some point, maybe bringing down our power systems. Uh, as we mentioned, you know, insider threats, um, they can be, um, you know, intentional, they can be unintentional, um, you know, the intentional ones, you know, as we mentioned, you know, you know, Edward Snowden, you know, this guy, he had, you know, granted trusted access, you know, you know, forget about, you know, the, the philosophical aspects of it, but you have somebody that had trusted uh, access into a system and took information from there and outside of it. Now, again, like I said, no arguments around the philosophical aspects and, you know, how and why, but the reality is, is you've got users um, and those that have trusted access to that really important stuff in our organizations, we do need to have extra layers of controls um, around what those activities are, right? Because uh, even in a small business, we have stuff that we have built. That's our, our secret sauce, right? Uh, and although it may not change the world, it's changing your world, right? It's paying for, you know, your mortgage and your car and your kids, you know, university and things like that. So certainly not anything that you would want put out there in the world. So anybody that has access to that type of thing, we'll, we'll talk about what the different types of controls that we can do to kind of help protect that. Um, but the reality is that when we look from a broad perspective, uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, University went out and did a a study on uh, insider threats and basically came back and said, hey, you know, there's there's really no, you know, real refined set of demographics around, you know, how to say, oh, this, oh, that, you know, <clears throat> John in the corner, there's an insider threat, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, but there are things, you know, there are times that that threat profile you know, just like we talked about going and doing business in different parts of the world, you know, different activities that are going on in our organizations may elevate the risk profile of people in our organization. So if you are having an impending layoff and, um, you know, you, you need to start doing things ahead of time uh, to prepare and protect that valuable information and, uh, you know, the assets that, that you have there. Um, so kind of keep those things in mind. All right, so those uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures that we talked about, these are kinds of those identifying things that, um, that you know, the, the bad guys are, you know, doing uh, as they prepare and kind of execute um, their attacks on us. Um, so that, that tactic is really kind of that start to finish kind of a strategy um, on 
you know, how they're going to, the attacker is going to, you know, gain access to this, you know, this valuable information that they've got. This is the, the you know, the, the how of the, uh, how it's all going to kind of play out um, uh, over kind of, you know, over kind uh, over time and how they're going to gain access to confidential information. The techniques are the not so specific, it's the what, you know, uh, what, what is the method that we're going to use to kind of Carry, uh, uh, carry out or uh, execute this compromise. <clears throat> and so this, you know, might be something like a phishing attack or spear phishing attack, things like that. And then uh, finally, we have procedures and procedures, just like, you know, in a traditional sense, when we think about our organizational policies and procedures, the procedure is really that step by step. So what are those steps that we take to be able to execute, you know, the activities that are aligned to our tactics, you know, our, our overall strategy and going to help us achieve that, what, you know, what are we gonna kind of do? But it is those step-by-step -step types of things, kind of, you know, view it as a, a recipe or a cookbook type of, uh, uh, of, a, of a thing. Um, all right, so there are a couple of different um, views on uh, or, or, or models out there on, on TTP. So uh, the, the Lockheed Martin uh, cyber kill chain has been around for a while. And as you can imagine, just by the name itself, you know, uh, derived from uh, the military type of a sense. But as you can see that, the, you know, it's a, it's a, a seven step process. And, and we'll see some of this, um, uh, some of these kinds of things you know, replicated or, or very similar on the, on the right side. And that's the MITRE uh, type of an attack. And MITRE is a large global uh, uh, think tank. And um, they've, they've got some uh, pretty incredible tools and uh, things that we're, we're gonna actually, uh, Chris uh, Alex Akis, who's on my team is gonna demonstrate some of that for you. But the Lockheed Martin, as you can see, just starts out with some type of a reconnaissance. Let me go out and uh, understand who my adversary is, you know, what kind of business are they in, uh, you know, where do they operate, uh, maybe to go see if I can find out who their suppliers are, who do they supply services to. I'm beginning to kind of create this, you know, this visual of, of my potential, you know, victim themselves, right? And that might be an organization, or it might be you, as an individual, right? But they're gonna go out and they're gonna learn some information uh, about you. Um, and then once they've kind of, you know, put the, collected that information, and if it's, you know, if it's a spear phishing attack, you know, maybe they go out and they look at your Facebook and go, oh, okay, so they went to Boston University, they, gra you know, graduated, and, you know, the same kind of an example we used in the last session, uh, you know, getting to the holiday season, uh, you know, maybe what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, a spear phishing attack that's going to look like uh, an invitation to a holiday uh, reunion for Boston University grads, you know, in my class, right? And so that's, that's what's going to, that's what I'm going to do, but I'm going to go collect some information to make it seem really legitimate. Then I'm going to go, you know, weaponize it. I'm going to go create Whatever that is, I'm going to get my, you know, my, my figure out, uh, you know, I'm going to do this through a PDF or am I going to do it through uh, malware embedded within a picture, you know, whatever it is and do. And I'm going to apply, I'm going to put that malware into whatever it is and compromise a website in the email, whatever that is, but I'm going to weaponize it, right? And then I'm going to send it off or I'm going to compromise the website. I'm going to send the email. I'm going to go out and deliver it. Now, hey, if, uh, if the recipient is, you know, clever and security aware, it may take me a couple of different, you know, tries to, to figure out how to get past, you know, the sophistication of my intended target. So just because I deliver it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to hit, you know, it's going to actually, you know, you're going to open it up and you're going to double click on it. And then whatever the malware is that I targeted for you system, you have the right vulnerability there so that the malware that I embedded actually exploits your system. So that speaks to, um, you know, regular patching and that, that process of applying the updates, you know, that we, 
um, that we get from Microsoft. They're setting, you know, especially you know, if you're on a Microsoft, you know, most people are, um, but you know, there are settings you can go into your system and make sure that those patches are being applied on a regular basis because uh, some of these very unsophisticated attackers will take advantage of the fact that number one, people tend to push off those updates, right? Because oh, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. You know, I can't, I don't want to go through this process of my machine being updated and it might reboot and I got to close all my files and uh, what a nightmare, right? And so we push them off, push them off, push them off. And the bad guys are hoping you do exactly that, right? Because they're pushing out these this malware, not super sophisticated, but it might exploit one of those weaknesses in your system that you haven't patched because you're too busy, right? <clears throat> so, you know, it's one of the things we can do to kind of help protect ourselves from some of that type of uh, uh, just kind of, you know, commodity malware that's out there. So, uh, but they have to deliver the malware or whatever it is, and then the exploit actually has to work. We have to have that vulnerability on our system, right? It hasn't had to have been patched, uh, or that weakness has to be there in order for the malware to exploit it. So if it does, then, hey, yes, the exploitation happens, the malware gets installed into that environment, and now the bad guys have what are called command and control. Um, so they have the ability to kind of communicate in the background. You'd never even know it was happening, but they have the ability to communicate with a bit of code that's sitting on your computer. And at any point in time, maybe they're pulling, you know, collecting information or, you know, what, again, we don't really know what those actions on objectives are. We don't know how far out into the future those actions on objectives are, um, but they're then going to do something. All right, so use that same kind of overall you know, uh, framework and you look at the MITRE attack and you can see some similarities in there, all right? Um, so let's go take a look. Uh, Chris, I'm gonna pass it over to you here real quick. And we're gonna go take a look at, um, uh, one tactic, one technique, show you the MITRE attack framework. I mean, it's super, you know, it's probably more than what you, you want to dig into, but we want to get a, at least give you some visibility into, you know, what's out there and from a cybersecurity perspective, uh, you know, what folks are seeing or what, what kind of access to tools and things that we've got. All right, Chris. Yes, sir. I'm pulling it up. Got it. I believe it's right here. This is going to be the gathering victim host information portion of our demonstration. Yeah, so this is, as you can see at the top there, the URL attack.mitre.org. Uh, and this is, um, uh, can you click on the, I want to see the, the big picture. Uh, oh, of all the versus, tactics? Yeah, please. Yeah, the, yeah, the enterprise one, sorry. Uh, actually, the, the, the wide view. I think that's the, the matrix matrices. Yes, exactly. Okay, so so this is the big picture, right? So MITRE has gone out. They continued, this continues to kind of evolve. But as you can see from kind of left to right, there's our reconnaissance. Way over on the right, we've got command and control. And all along the way are these different types of techniques that they have identified are very commonly used. So when we talk about risk-driven types of protections, we, again, we wanna understand our adversaries and what are the TTPs that are common for them. And then we want to implement in a prioritized fashion, you know, uh, defenses against these types of things, all right? So just kind of an overall picture. All right, Christy, you can jump back. All right, so yeah, we're in the reconnaissance phase, gathering victim host information. Uh, go ahead. There we go. And you know, if you've if you're interested in this kind of stuff, you can go out here, you can read all about it. Um, but this will give you details about um, you know what are the you know the activities that are kind of going on, what's the purpose behind it. You know, here's going to gather in uh, victim host information. And then obviously we're going to use that at some point along the way uh, to execute our attack. Um, some other great information. Uh, yeah, well, as you can see, the other types of uh, reconnaissance things on the left, the gathering victim for uh, identity information, 
uh, organizational information, all these types of things. You can come in here and use this to your benefit to get a begin to understand uh, you know, what the bad guys are that are targeting you or doing. One of the other interesting things is, Chris, can you click on the group section here? Um, is uh, you can come in here and you can, you can you know, do searches and you, and you can understand, well, hey, for these different types of threat actors that are out there, what are the types of TTPs that we, they, they would use? So for example, uh, if you click on APT1, uh, so this is a, a Chinese um, um, uh, adversary advanced persistent threat. And as you kind of scroll down, you can see, look, oh, look at all these different types of techniques that are being used, very commonly used. Um, because, you know, hey, um, you like any other, you know, business or organization, you know, you got certain people on your team, they got certain strengths, you know, and so you do see some uh, commonality between you know behavioral and technical kinds of things that uh, the bad guys are doing, and so depending on which groups or APT that's out there, uh, but you can come in, you can learn about them. Uh, some very interesting things. There'll there'll be links out to stories that you can read about the actual attacks that are that are being uh, performed out there in the uh, in the out in the world. So. All right, so Chris, can you give me back uh, control there? Yes, sir. All right. Okay, so yeah, so we definitely want to uh, make sure that we're understanding our adversary. So what can we do, you know, there uh, to kind of protect ourselves from it. Well, we've got some physical controls, right? That we're going to talk about our technical controls and then administrative controls. So those physical controls, uh, all right. So we've got important information. Uh, we want to be able to employ encryption wherever we can. Now, a lot of times as a small business, you know, we're going to use services that use encryption. But like we saw last week, hey, we need to maybe put a, a certificate on our website to make sure that our customers feel like, you know, even though there may not be anything sensitive on our website, uh, when they're there, they want we want them to feel secure. So, you know, what is that small investment we can make in a website uh, certificate? Um, but then there's the other physical stuff. So yeah, yeah, we got CCT TVs, we've got, you know, gates and fences and, you know, those physical kinds of things that we can do to put that kind of outer perimeter, the physical outer perimeter because it doesn't take much. Once the bad guys are in your environment, uh, very quickly, you plug in a USB and in about you know, three seconds, you have an exploit in your environment. Uh, they can tap into your, to your cables. There's lots of different ways that if they have physical access, um, you know, bad things can kind of happen in your environment. Then administrative types of controls. Um, so what do we do? Um, you know, ourselves, do we want you to do you know, background checks on our employees? What happens? Who has access to, you know, certain parts of our organization? What, is there a two layer checkoff required for any invoice over, you know, $600, right? Or whatever that number is that, you know, hey, there's a, another set of eyeballs, you know, that that's looking at that, right? Or, do we always make a phone call to the supplier for any invoice that's over a thousand dollars, right? And not the supplier that's you know sent the invoice in their email, but a known good phone number to call those folks are. So there's different types of things, and of course, training our employees is obviously a very important thing that we can do from an administrative types of thing. So no technology even really kind of required for this stuff. And then we, you know, obviously we talk about security awareness and what we can do uh, for our employees. We talked about, you know, phishing and, you know, the, the, the script kitties, you know, uses very just kind of broad based type of attack. And a lot of times they're, they're counting on the fact that we're not applying those patches on a regular basis on our system. So we, we definitely want to get into the habit of doing that. Spear phishing is that, that bit more targeted. So they're looking at you as an individual and it might, you, you know, that, not necessarily the CEO, but you know maybe you're you've got on your LinkedIn profile that you're the system administrator for this medium-sized business, and you're important for yeah you know, you're you're 
you know, the, the, the man in the, 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 with all the knowledge when it comes to the critical systems, you're putting that stuff out there on LinkedIn or somewhere else, you know, you're raising your threat profile. You definitely could end up being a, a targeted victim for spear phishing, but they've kind of isolated you as an individual with some kind of privileged uh, access into an environment. And they will invest more time, more energy uh, in crafting that target attack like that that, uh, you know, that invitation to the holiday party for Boston University type of thing, right? Because once I get to you, I know I, I'm going to very quickly gain access to some critical systems. And then finally, whaling, that's where you are, you are an executive. And as you can imagine, you know, the higher, you know, up we can kind of go, the more time they're going to invest in trying to uh, exploit that individual so they can use those credentials. Because when, you know, when the boss tells you to jump, you jump, right? So uh, when the boss tells you to pay this invoice, you pay this invoice, There's, you know. Uh, so, you know, you can, again, you can go back, you can have those administrative types of controls and, you know, make sure that those things are kind of happening. But understand that the bad guys, depending on where you're at in the organization, what your responsibilities are, they absolutely will make the investment in the time and the technology to be able to try to exploit you to gain access to your stuff. All right, Q&A, any questions? Let's see, Chris, do we have any questions in the chat? Uh, I do not see any questions in the chat. If you have questions, please offer those up right now. You can throw them in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, and we can got a couple minutes, about a minute or two left. So one or two questions can squeeze in. While we're waiting for questions, would you guys like us to go through the Kali Linux tools list or anything like that? I can show that on the screen if that's- Yeah, here, I think I can pull that up, Chris, since I've got yeah, this. Yeah, go ahead screen. and pull that yeah. up for a second so people can see it and, and access yeah. it. Yeah, so you should see it now on the screen. Um, does everybody see, are you seeing that, Robert, the Kali tools? Yes, okay. sir. Okay, great. Okay, so you can see there are like over 300 tools. Uh, at last time I counted, there were over 300. But all of these types of tools, so this is just the list of tools. This is not Kali Linux itself, but it is the website. So you can very quickly go out, uh, uh, you know, create a virtual machine, download this software, and in just a few clicks, have access to lots of different types of tools. And you'll see in here, one of those, um, if I can get into the alphabetical list here, I'm scrolling down. I can find the SET. All right, uh, set. Right there. There's so many tools. Did, did I miss it? Yeah, you went you went past it a little bit. Uh, if you keep scrolling, set uh, set is going to be right in the middle of your screen. There it right is. Now. Okay. Yeah. So here's a you know this is a a, a whole uh, tool that is designed for. Um, social engineering attacks. As you can see down here on the bottom, as I mentioned, you know, click, 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 click. And the next thing you know, you're off and running and, you know, breaking the law, right? So um, uh, very, very straightforward, powerful, great, right? For people that want to learn this stuff. Uh, and, you know, if you're trying to do some things, um, uh, you always, you, you know, you, you don't, unless you have a signed contract agreement, you never want to use these tools against anybody uh, or any organization, you know, aside uh, for those that you have permission to do so. But you can use these kinds of tools uh, to kind of test against your own environment. Just understand that, you know, that, you know, if you don't really understand the tool itself, you might end up causing some harm that you won't be able to buy, you know, back yourself out of. So just kind of, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, you don't bite off too much uh, from these tools because they absolutely can be very powerful types of things. But all right, Excellent. Jeffrey, we have one question in there, and we're right at time, so let's give you an answer real quick. Okay, uh, it says, so what are the main practical things we can do as a small business? Yeah, so I would encourage you to kind of go back and look at the previous session. We covered uh, some major things. Uh, yeah, certainly multi-factor authentication is, in, is an important type of thing. Uh, website security cert certificates, uh, SPF, DMARC, DKIM types of things, security awareness, 
Uh, yeah, but the two-factor authentication, very, very, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great low water mark for types of uh, of a control. That's when you get in a separated a separate email or a one-time passcodes and those kinds of things. But understand, right, that the bad guys will will try to exploit um, these uh, the use of these one-time passcodes to you know, for their own ill will. So you never want to give a one-time passcode to anybody, anybody. So, you know, if, if a lot of times we'll see it coming up in like, um, oh, like in Craigslist or some of the online shopping, you know, types of websites, you know, you're listing a, you know, a, an end table for sale and they're interested in it. And, you know, they say, well, you know, I'd, you know, I'd love to buy this from you, but I need to prove that you're a real person. This is them saying this to you. I need to prove that you're not a scammer. So I'm going to send you a code. Uh, and I need, you know, to, I, so I need your phone number and I need your code. So I'm going to send you that code. You read it back to me. Then I'll know whether you're actually a real person and not an attacker. But what's going on in the background is they're, they're, they're either trying to exploit your banking system or trying to take control over your phone number through Google Voice. And they've triggered something in the background that is generating a one-time passcode. The, you know, that other system is generating the one-time passcode and they're just waiting for you to give it to them so they can enter it into the system. And now they have actually authenticated into, uh, you know, your banking system or a transfer of your phone number to Google Voice, and then and that will be used for, you know, spamming and vishing and other types of an attacks um, that are out there. But we encourage you, you know, if you got other questions, uh, don't hesitate to, you know, reach out to us. Um, I think our contact information is available through the uh, BAZ on the site or in the uh, presentations themselves. And Jeff, do you mind if I add on to that real quick? Uh, yeah, one of, the of course. Other yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the other main things that he even mentioned, uh, cybersecurity awareness, right? Uh, if you have employees, even if it is just you running your business, proper cybersecurity information and safety for you, your employees, everybody. Uh, one of the things that the DOD has started to implement is something called CMMC. Uh, and it's a basic certification for these government contracted businesses that are to prove that they have the proper cybersecurity awareness and network to hold data coming from the DOD and the government. So take that into consideration if you're going to be working with the government, even if you're a small business, some of these classifications are a requirement. So proper cybersecurity awareness is the key when it comes to a practical thing for a small business. Yeah. And, you know, as, and, you know, and as we saw, you know, 70, 70 to 80% of employees are still, you know, even after everything that we've talked about uh, and, you know, even some of the security awareness may you've done in your own companies, they're still clicking on those emails, you know, uh, you know, it ended up in malicious sites or opening uh, attachments. So, um, Security awareness is critical. We know that humans are going to continue to be the target for the bad guys. So the smarter we can make our people, because it really is, you know, we, we do have the technology that's helping out, but practically it ends up in our lap or on our keyboard. We have to decision that. So the more, the more intelligent um, uh, we can make our staff, um, you know, it, it, it makes them that strongest link in the security chain as opposed to the weakest one. Excellent. Well, thank you, Jeffrey and, and Alex, or Chris um, or, and Lindsay for being here. Uh, we appreciate you doing both these sessions for us. Uh, great information. Again, everybody, this is being recorded. So if you want to go back and watch it, we should have it posted later today on our website along with our slide deck. And uh, again, we appreciate everybody for being here. We uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up and we will see you on Thursday morning. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Robert.